listening to the My Pet Podcast, the show for pet lovers of Australia and around the world. Hi, you're listening to the My Pet Podcast. I'm Aria, and as always, I'm joined by our resident vet, Dr. Glenn. Hello. How are you going? Good. That's good. And we have a very special guest with us today. We have Anne from Positive Connection. Hello. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So we've already done a couple of episodes with Anne. We are talking to Anne and picking her brain about uh, dog barking. Um, and Glenn is also sharing some really helpful info with us about that as well. Trying to. You no, know, you, you know, <laughs> I've, le- I've learned so much already from you guys. Um, and this episode is the one where um, we're really going to get in and, and, and talk about how to a- address and reduce um, nuisance or... Um, you know, barking because we don't yeah. want to. We've we've learned that we don't want to. Well, we can't stop barking altogether because that would be like trying to get a chatterbox like me to be quiet, and that's just <laughs> not going to happen. <laughs> um, so we just want to um, reduce that barking yeah. and um, yeah, to a more manageable level. Yeah, mm. but also we want to um, like, I guess, reduce whatever the problem is that the dog is barking about. Yeah, if we can. Absolutely. Um, so first things first, um, Anne mentioned this in a previous episode. It's such a great idea. If you have a dog that is starting to be barky or already barky or that you know is going to be barky, it's a great idea to do up a little letter for your neighbours. Um, I did this with my dog. I had a little picture of him just after he had his leg amputated because I knew that he was going to start being really rowdy and noisy and probably wasn't going to slow down. So a little picture of him and just said, hi, I'm Sage. I've had a little bit of a rough start to life, but my, my vet, Dr. Glenn, I didn't say Dr. Glenn, but that's his vet. He's helping me out. <laughs> so um, that just kind of took the pressure off from the neighbours when he was a little pup. Um, and like, who can complain to the council about the cute face that they see? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, buys you some time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but um, so um, the first step is to find out the cause of the barking, right? Yeah, absolutely. Finding out the cause, why it's happening. Uh, it might be for a reason that you don't, that you're not thinking that it is. So um, that's why we talked about in the previous episodes about getting cameras up and that sort of thing to find out exactly what's going on. Yeah, it can, it can be quite a complex thing to figure out. So that's why we did an entire episode about that. So yep. if you haven't listened to that, go back, check that one out. Um, and yes, then um, you can sort of um, figure out what's happening, which then helps you to um, know which direction to head in what to do. Yep, exactly. exactly. Um, so the second step is to change or manage the environment? Yes, it can be a huge, actually probably crucial step of changing uh, barking behaviour is looking at the environment that your dog is in and managing it to help with certain types of barking. How to to reduce that is working with that environment. So, for example, if your dog is barking um, outside at night at the possums, then one really easy thing to do is to not give them access to that at night to bring them inside. Yeah. And if you don't want your dog inside the house, then perhaps there might be another solution such as a den area or a crate that you can teach them to be in. Yeah. So changing the environment is just absolutely huge, whether that's removing your dog from that environment or changing how the environment looks yep. can play a really, really huge part. Yeah. yeah. And often... We, it's going to take much, much longer to change something if we're not, if you're not willing to change the actual environment. Yeah. Wow. So it's like that big of... Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Okay. Huge. Um, yep. Well, I often do say that Sage is barking about climate change. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to change the, the, the general environment of the world um, to <laughs> reduce his barking. Could be a longer term project. <laughs> yeah, could be. Could be. Um, but while, I, while we work uh, to um, try and stop climate change... <laughs> What are, what are some other ways, like what are ways that you can change the environment? Like yep. say, okay, Sage likes to bark at 
the farmer across the road when he's bringing the cattle in on his motorbike. Right, right. So as I said, removing your dog from being able to see that area, and if that's not possible, then you can put up things like uh, visual barriers or fences to prevent access to that certain part of the yard okay. or the property. So um, visual barriers work really well um, depending on what you're using, but it's really, really important to just like, whether it's shea cloth or anything that's just blocking the vision, yep. uh, then even though they can still hear and they can still smell what's going on, it's, it makes training an alternative behaviour so much easier if they can't actually see yeah, what okay. it is that they're, that they're barking at. Yep. So, um, yeah, so in the suburbs we, we often will get um, dogs barking at things going past fences and often if you have fences that have like uh, little gaps uh, underneath or through the fence, you can actually... It's like a strobe effect, like for the dog. Yeah. It's like, oh, you're there, you're not, you're there, you're not. Um, so putting up visual on that just to stop that will really, really help. Yeah. Um, and it just stops that intensity at which your dog is um, like full on thinking, right, I need to get that thing away from my property. And yeah. then, um, then providing that visual block is really important. Um, and then sometimes just the access as well. So you know, putting a little um, double fence in and things like mm -hmm. that can, can definitely help. Yeah. Mm. Um, and so is changing the environment um, mainly about like that visual block or are there other changes to the environment that aren't such a visual thing for the dog? Well, just removing them yeah. from that area. Okay. So again, like bringing them inside, bringing them to it, like having different different access points and things like that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just working out exactly what it is. So as I said, if your dog is barking at something in a particular area of the yard, then let's just move them away from that completely and not give them access to it. And even if it's only at certain points of the day. Yeah. So it might be that in the morning when it's super busy, when you've got all the foot traffic, all the kids going to school, uh, then, okay, let's not give our dog access to the front yard. Let's yeah. have them in the back. And that's going to help with that um, that arousal level as well that comes with that that sort of territorial barking of like yes. get away, get away. It's like, you know, let's just bring everything down, just have everything calm and not give them access to that point at all. Yes. And that's another thing is um, – that, that's important is to reduce the arousal level of the dog. Yeah, definitely. So if you've got um, high energy dogs that are barking all the time at everything in the environment, they're constantly li living on this in this high adrenaline state. So bringing that arousal level down is really important as well. So you can do that by, again, bringing them inside, having, you know, um, downtime, teaching them to switch off, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think excite, like the term excitement with dogs is um, a bit of a tricky one because excitement in the terms that we talk about it for, with dogs and training is not necessarily the kind of excitement like when I see ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> it's not necessarily a positive, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like um, can you ex kind of explain that? Because I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to explain that kind of like what to look for for that excitement because I think I see so many people mistake that negative excitement for positive excitement yeah but i mean it is difficult because i mean sometimes you just get escalations of behavior because they just get excited and and i mean if you look at the neurochemistry of it like adrenaline and um neuro noradrenaline in the brain like that can escalate um unfavorable behaviors a lot of the time because the brain is just going so fast that the dog is you've removed the ability of the dog to think for itself, yep. basically. So um, when they're in an overstimulated state, they just do things and make bad choices that they don't necessarily make, like when they're um, you know, displacing aggressive behaviour onto them, whatever's around them because they're just so um, uh, wound up, basically. Yeah. So um, there's excitement with, you know, you can cause um, my dogs get excited when they get treats and that sort of thing, and that's a good positive sort of excitement. Yeah. But then there's the excitement of, okay, if everyone's barking and, and I'm barking and then, you know, there's plenty of dog fights happen at the mm. front fence when there's your two dogs and the other two dogs next door and everyone's barking at each other and then all of a sudden your dogs that get on really well are all of a sudden fighting yeah. each other because yeah. they can't get to the dogs next door that they want to fight. Yeah. Um, so that sort of um, arousal stimulation when it goes um, into excess, yeah, it becomes a major problem. Yeah. 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 Um, sorry? No, I was going to say a non-technical term for um, dogs being off their face. That's sometimes <laughs> what us trainers would say. They're just <laughs> off their face. It's not, kind of <laughs> not thinking straight, just barking at everything, just yeah. being like, you know, yeah, totally off their face. They just, they just get unresponsive. Like you just can't, like, you've got to de-escalate that somehow. Yeah. If you're trying to train them, like, you've got to break in there somewhere to get them to actually take any notice of anything. Otherwise, it's just you're just adding to the cacophony that's going on in the yeah, brain. That's right. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> yeah. um, and... Uh, 
Another thing that um, I've heard both of you talk about is um, like a balance between um, the um, physical and mental exercise. So and and that it's not always necessarily a good thing to to have too much of one or the other, right? Definitely, definitely. Yeah, more more isn't better necessarily. Yeah. yeah. So you don't want to. Often people will say that they, especially if they have a working breed dog, that they think they have to exercise them to the point of exhaustion so that they'll you know, relax for part of the day. But actually, that's causing more um, more ad- adrenaline and in the body and all that sort of thing. So it can be worse. So we actually want to have a really good balance between physical and mental exercise. So mental exercise being um, using the brain. So um, enrichment toys, um, scent work, all that sort of thing that's really getting them to do things that tire them out but not actually physically doing it. Yeah. So, um, and, and we're not suggesting that you don't exercise your dog. Of course, you need to walk them and provide them with what they need. But it is finding that balance and every dog would be different with what is better for them. Yeah. Um, and th- there is no doubt that some dogs do require more exercise than others. Yeah. And we all know the lazy greyhound that sits on the um, on the sofa and needs a, a five-minute walk or whatever. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, we, we know that a lot of more active dogs do need more exercise. But it's so important to get that balance right with that, that mental exercise. I know a lot of working breed dogs that would run all day but when they've done um, three scent work searches in their scent work class, they're, yeah. exhausted. they're actually more exhausted than yeah. if they've been playing yeah. um, sports all day. Yep. So it's really um, effective and can get them and tire them out, um, their brain out as well, which is yeah. really important. It, yeah. I think it, like I've found with Sage, my dog, that it's also the kind of exercise that he does. Like if I play fetch with him, he seems to just get like more and more and more excited yeah right um yeah whereas if i take him for a you know like a loose lead walk where he's you know sniffing all the kangaroo poo yeah. and whatnot then he he's really quite chilled out about it yeah. um whereas if i took him for you know a run where i'm running i mean i don't run like if you're watching this you can see me i don't run but if i did and when i've tried same thing again i find he and this is just him personally like he gets yeah. more elevated yeah that's right yeah Um, Yeah. probably because he's like oh god my owner's gonna die it's running (laughs) well and they're using i mean effectively less of their senses probably because i mean they've the faster they go okay they're using their bodies more but they they're not interpreting all the subtle smells that they're smelling and and like they can't hear as much and like they're not focusing on as much so everyone's seen the cattle dog down the road that's got the foot deep path worn along the front fence where they just go up and down up and down up and down and, and they're really fit but they're not using their brain at all yeah. because I mean that's right to the yeah. point where it becomes a stereotypical behavior where they're making themselves go to a happy place by just physically exhausting themselves but they're not using anything else yeah, yeah. that's the only task that their body's doing but their brain's completely switched off yeah um, so it's yeah using you know more of their senses and that becomes really important too with you know older dogs that are less physically capable yeah. of exercising um and you know through injuries or just worn out and, and you know they've got physical constraints well that's yes. where you know mental stimulation um because dogs become blind and dogs become deaf but they don't seem to lose their sense of smell yeah. so i mean yeah. know, nose work and all those sort of things you know become really important um with ways of stimulating them without you know if you've got a border collie that you've got a run for an hour every day well when it's 14 you can't run for an hour well what's your other options yeah Yeah. you probably should have thought of another option before that yeah Yeah. i mean my dog sage he's only got three legs so i don't like to put too much pressure on his joints absolutely he loves a good swim like if he can Mm. get a a, a swim fetch in he's he's good at that but i think there's a bit of mental um there's a fair bit of mental like he has to think about where to swim and it's yeah. a bit more challenging mentally for him yeah but um so we we love the enrichment toys we've actually done a few videos recently um, about slow feeding um and um so he was a um i guess an actor <laughs> so but the days that we record we did the slow feeding and he had a few slow feeders um in one day he was like tuck it out he was such a chill guy he was like yeah you know just I'm very happy dog. I'm laying around. He was he was good. There was no yeah. barking that yeah, day. Yeah, exactly. That was good. And and that's where obviously using the appropriate type of enrichment can come in, especially for dogs that are bark, barking because they're bored. Yeah. Um, and they're just barking for the hell of it. Um, then giving them actually ditch the bowl and give them lots of things, lots of toys to play with, and um, appropriate ways to give them their food. 
yeah. is, uh, is really important as well. And that will depend on the dog, what you use, but yeah. um, how destructive they destructive they are and all that sort of thing but yes. um yeah but there's options for, for all different dogs definitely we have videos definitely. about that on our youtube yep um so we're kind of we're kind of encroaching now onto the third step um which is the training yep. um so um what what is what is the training that we can do this is such a huge topic as well it is and it de- and it does depend it goes back to the type of barking that we're seeing right yeah. um so we've talked about obviously like environmental management and we've talked about our arousal control for those dogs that are living up on on the high all the time so if we're looking at barking that's due to anxiety um so stress anxiety separation distress that sort of thing we can we can do training to teach them to be alone or what we call home alone. Okay. Um, that is if we've ruled out. Um, so we obviously need to get veterinary checks. And sometimes if it's really severe, uh, it may require some intervention from, um, from the vet as well in terms of medication and things like that. But um, if the dog is just not used to being alone, um, and, and that happens a lot these days because yeah. of, um, you know, dogs are used to having everybody around. Yes. And then when people start to go back to work, they start to freak out. So you can teach them to be alone in very short steps. Yeah. And okay. often people will go too far too soon. So it can often be, you know, oh, I've left my dog for 30 minutes and then I go th- 45, an hour. We need to actually go back to where the dog is okay and that could be seconds, it could be minutes. Um, so you could just do little micro absences and just teach them to be alone. Yeah. Um, and that can be done. It's often best to be done with the guidance of a trainer. Yeah, with I that. was just going to say. Yeah, because like, it can be quite uh, quite tricky yeah. to do. But uh, you can definitely teach them to be alone um, and to be quite happy to be alone rather than um, the alternative of barking and, and, you know, just being destructive and things like that. Yeah. So we do um, what we call our home alone training. Um and again, it depends. So obviously if the dog is barking because they're bored, we go back to look at like activities and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, if the dog is barking because they're fearful of something, so um, it might be that they're barking at um, the garbage truck that comes down the street or the postman, that's very pretty common. You can do a process that we call desensitisation and counter conditioning. Okay. So that is actually teaching the dog that it's not so scary and that other things can be you know, in their place. So we can do, um, so I do have a colleague of mine that was, um, that taught their dog to play with a tug toy. Um, So, you know, the tug toys that you can attach to, um, uh, the Aussie dog tug toys that you can attach. Yeah, so, and it, so you rattled can attach around them like to just for anyone who's strong. Yeah. yeah, so like out in the veranda, she had one of the Aussie dog Home Alone toys that has food, like dry food in it. And every time the garbage truck came down the street, she taught him to play tug with the toy um, and get all the food out. So every time the garbage truck came down the street, he would automatically, like after a lot of training, he would automatically just go and play tug. And because he's playing tug and getting all the food out of the toy, he's not barking because he's got something in his mouth. So That's really cool. So you can do, you can train alternative behaviours. Okay, so your dog is alert barking at something and they're, uh, you want to teach them that that's enough you don't have to keep going. So you can teach them to come back. So we do a behaviour chain where we teach them to come back, go onto your mat, sit, lay down, and then be quiet, and then put quiet on cue. Um, so that's, thank you very much. We've had enough of that bark for now. We know that there's, it's all good. You know, just relax, just chill out. That kind um, of also teaches the dog that it's okay too. Like, would yeah. that, does that reduce the anxiety? Yeah, absolutely. So like, we want to acknowledge the fact that, yes, you've done your job. Thank you very much. That's great. But you don't need to bark anymore. It's fine. It's just, and often I'll say that to my dogs, it's just the neighbour or it's just so-and-so or it's just this or it's just that dog. It's fine. And they can j- take the cue off you as well so they okay. can go, okay, well, all right, it must be okay. Job okay. done. Um, yeah, job is done. Um, particularly for those dogs that like to be a bit guardy and territorially yes. around the house, then yes. we can yeah, really just say, yep, yeah, thanks very much, you've done your job and yeah. we can move on. Uh, but putting quiet on cue is kind of cool as well and that's good for um, attention-seeking barking which we probably haven't talked a lot about, Um, one of the ones we might have missed out. But um, attention-seeking barking can be so frustrating for people because it's so often reinforced really easily by just looking at the dog and it's like, yep, gotcha, (laughs) thanks very much. So, um, yeah, so you can actually teach quiet on cue for things like that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And teaching quiet on cue is different than just being like, oh, my God, be quiet. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. So if you yell at your dog for barking, they often just – 
think, yep, yep, you're getting worked up too, I know, isn't it? Isn't that right? Like, yep, you're really yeah, like, you I know, know frustrated too. Have you too. seen these pigeons on the driveway? Yeah, they're there all the time and I'm just not going. <laughs> they're crazy, right? <laughs> what are they doing? What do they yeah. think this is? <laughs> yeah, so if you if you yell, at, like, your dog just thinks that you're barking too and they just, everything just gets heightened and, you know, and it's a bit counterproductive. Yeah. Yep. So um, I should be like, hey, it's okay. They're just pigeons. They're allowed to be on the driveway. Yep. But thanks for letting me know. Thank you very much. Yep, yeah, exactly. Come and chill out. Yeah. Okay. And then you can desensitise your dog to things like that um, by the training process we were talking about, desensitisation counter conditioning. Yeah. Where you actually, you know, can look at things from a distance. Um, you have your dog maybe on lead and look, there's a neighbour over there and like – at that neighbor that's a good boy and then they get a treat for looking at the neighbor and then gradually move closer and closer so they get desensitized to things that might be worrying them in the environment yeah. so whether that's a garbage truck or the neighbor or um, whatever it is in the environment that you can actually desensitize them to and work on changing their response to it yeah. so that they think cool I don't mind it when birds land on the in the garden or whatever yes so, yeah. yeah so you can definitely go through a training process it's much easier to do when you have the guidance of a professional trainer to help you through yeah uh, because if you do it wrong it can you know obviously backfire so we want to do it really well and change again change those underlying emotions to things so your dog feels that they don't really need to they don't have to bark at all that stuff all the yeah. time yeah and i guess like we talked about um in one of the episodes about um how with bark collars one of the reasons that they they're ineffective is because dogs can make random associations with things yep. um and i guess that the would i be right in saying that like if you're trying to make a positive association and maybe he doesn't associate the the mat and the treat with the pigeon but you know with something else well then it's not necessarily harm done exactly like exactly. he's okay yep. he's got a positive association to something he didn't need to yeah i will We'll get the pigeons next time. Yeah. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, I, I, in a way. Like it's – it's yeah, it's different obviously with barking collars we're um, creating not-so-nice associations because of the pain from the collars – um, and the aversive from the collars. But what we're trying to do is teach the dog with um, with our other training is to teach them that it's actually fine. You can, like, it's a, it's a good association to have these things yeah. around. So, yeah. And I guess um, they also, you know, if, if you're not home, but when you are home, you're doing this stuff, it's building, like, healthier habits for them. Yes. And what I always say to people is that if this is why managing the environment is so important because if you're not home – you may not want to leave your dog out in the yard to bark at everything because they will still do that if yeah. you're not there to redirect them to do something else. So keeping them, so for example, my dogs, and it may not be, it may not work for everybody and I totally understand that and that's why we have to work with, you know, individuals and their dogs, but mm. my dogs are inside when I'm not home um, for safety reasons and also that they probably would bark at things, absolutely. Yeah. They would be barking at the dogs next door. They would be running around and causing havoc. And I don't want them to do that. I don't want them to practice that. Yeah. So, um, so managing that environment and and often if it's look, it can be anything from, um, you know, sometimes people will use doggy daycare and um, pet sitters and pet walkers and things like that, so that you can um, they they have a break up in the day or they're yeah. not even in the environment, so you can take them out of the environment and use doggy daycare and things like that. Um, but if you're not home and you can't, um, you know. If they're going to be barking at things, then you need to manage that environment as best as you can. So pop them in the backyard rather than the front yard and, and that sort of thing. And yeah. then when you are home, that's when you do the training. And that's when all those that repetition and all that training will come into place. And it makes it easier to call them away the more that you do all those repetitions. Yep. So um, you, touched, you touched briefly on them, but um, we'll just go through a few of the, the reasons that dogs bark and, and sort of... Um, well, a couple of different ways to manage them. Yep. Um, so you mentioned a few things about anxiety and, um, yeah, obviously first you need to go and see your vet. Um, so Definitely, um, yep. My dog Sage, he um, had some anxiety, so I took him to see Glenn and some of the folks at Glenn's clinic. Um, can I just ask you about um, things like... Um, some some calming supplements like Zilkeen yep. and, and Adaptal collars because um, I used them on the recommendation of vet and um, they they really helped so um, I think they're they're one option that I would be good to to just to, to discuss yeah absolutely I mean anxiety is a, a a wide and varied um, topic because I mean there's certainly different severities severities of anxiety and um, 
to me, there's not okay. There's just not one pill that fixes things. No. Um, and some people, when they've got bad anxiety um, issues with their dog, they'll go to the vet and want the pill. Um, and it's a bit like the shot call, like it's it's wanting a quick fix to the mm. scenario. And and some dogs that have got um, enough anxiety issues stacked in their favour, they'll. I mean, they need pharmacological, or they would respond better with pharmacological intervention like um, you know prescription medications that um, reduce anxiety but there's to me it's the more things you can do in the more varied ways the better the results are going to be so yes yeah. that could be prescription medications um, at the start with the aim for being not being on a lifetime of prescription medications yeah. um, using other aids like you know um, anxiety storm shirts thunder shirts that yeah. can um, help reduce anxiety in in that way and, and maybe that helps 25 percent over here and then um, the adaptal collars um, or adaptal um, diffusers that are a pheromone um, and that's a pheromone that the mother um, dog releases and it makes the feeling of well-being um, for the dog so if you've got an anxiety disorder and that pheromone's either coming out of the collar or it's in the environment from the um, from the diffuser that helps them be more settled and less anxious in that situation. So they could help in you know, in that way. Um, Zilkeen's been on the market for probably th- three years now, I think. Um, it's a, um, a, a treatment for mild to moderate anxiety disorders and it's, uh, again, a supplement that um, it's based on a milk casein protein that works on maybe the GABA pathways in the brain, so just one of the neurotransmitters. Yeah. Um, but... You know, we get good results from that um, with a lot of pets, and it's got to be in the um, in the diet for a couple of days to start to work. So it's not a there's a storm coming tonight. I, I give it a single capsule, and it's going to miraculously fix things. Um, but but it, maybe it, over the course of the storm season, absolutely. Um, so it, it can help, and then um, bringing in other training aids um, to desensitise to the things that they're anxious to depending on what the anxiety situation is Um, so then we can hopefully you know not rely on prescription medications or you know withdraw them over time and and have to do less because you've actually made the life of the pet better because you reduced or removed those anxiety triggers or um, augmented their reaction to those anxiety triggers so I mean to me um Yes, getting a vet checkup is really, really important because um, sometimes those um, anxious things are responses to external stimuli like storms and thunders and, and loud noise and all that sort of thing. And sometimes it's you know, a response to pain um, in the pet from um, arthritis or back pain or something like that. And they're having an anxiety response to a, um, a physical problem. Yeah. Um, so then there's um, pain relief medications that help to treat the pain and that helps reduce the anxiety but they also need medication sometimes to help the anxiety side of things as well um so that's where yeah um veterinary intervention is often needed if things escalate a lot but if you intervene early and you're in tune with your um, pet's behavior um you know training and desensitization and behavioral modification and environmental modification can help so we don't have to end up at your vet or go to a um, a specialist um, veterinarian who specializes in behavioral problems to to try and sort that out yeah i mean like with sage i saw pretty early on the the early warning signs of it um so that's when i came to talk to you guys and and i guess it's like even with like i know with my own mental health that it some of it is like um you know the the medication side and then it's also, you know, maybe 30% that, 30%, yeah. you know, the environmental stuff. And then the other stuff is like, you know, behavioural. Yeah. Like, and and, yeah. and, <laughs> and, 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 and thought it, thinking and that sort of thing. I guess dogs are pretty much the same. Like you, it, there's no, not just one thing. You have to kind of look at a holistic approach. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and, I mean, things trigger st- triggers stack in a negative way and yeah. things escalate um, over time but um, I mean positive triggers escalate over time as well and and you know if you remove the things that are causing problems well things get better over time as well yeah um, so you're just trying to yeah. attack things from as many angles as possible um, yeah gives you the best result who knew yep yeah, yeah. that's it Funny that. <laughs> yep. um, and I guess while we're on the topic of like the more medical side of things um can you talk us through um, cognitive decline and, and what people can and should do about that? Yep. Yeah, cognitive decline is – I mean, it certainly happens. Like, there is physiological 
um, changes in the brain um, of people, animals, um, to do with ageing and specific conditions that happen more commonly with age um, that affect the way the brain works. So um, it's not just that they're getting old, like you can have blood um, flow restrictions through certain parts of the brain and that affects the way the brain works. So um, there are prescription medications that can help with that, okay. but a lot of the time it's ruling out um, all the other stuff as well, like, um, okay, is this a pain response? Is this um, a less input response? Uh, as you know, they going deaf so they don't hear things as well so um, that affects their appearance of their cognitive function because they just right. don't hear things as well yeah and have they got cataracts and they're going blind so they don't see things as well so are they living in a little a smaller world that yeah. they've just got less input so they they just sit around and sleep all day and yeah is that because their brains are working as well or is it because they don't hear the dogs barking down the road as yeah. much and talking about barking well are they half hearing what they used to hear so they can't hear that it was a specific thing they just hear a dull something so they're barking all the time because they can only half hear stuff um, yeah, yeah. and and their voice probably doesn't sound as loud either <laughs> so, yeah. so, they, so they bark more because of that um so yeah so cognitive decline i mean there are certainly um specific conditions that can cause it and there's specific treatments for it but it's also again a multi-factorial thing of yeah. um have they got you know kidney issues or liver issues that's causing the brain not to work as well yeah so get, yes get, get your dog checked out get some very tests very complex that's why we have people like you who've done all that research and <laughs> try, study try and read all through it <laughs> yeah. but then like it's okay once you've got the physical health stuff sorted out well then you've still got to try and make your dog's life as happy as possible um and um, training's a big part of that as well yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely and environmental yeah. factors yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so um, then, I think one one that's I would I'd say pretty common is boredom. Is that pretty common? Yep, yep, I'd say so. Yep, boredom barking for sure. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, and th again, that's just looking at your specific dog and what they, what's going to work for them in terms of um, providing that stimulation for them. So some dogs may need something that. So if you have activities that get them moving around, it might actually just get them more heightened and more excited. So it might be activities that actually just have them just nice and calm. So yeah. licking and chewing and things like that, uh, snuffling around in the grass to find their food uh, rather than, you know, um, things that they can swing off and hang on and things like that. Yeah. But, um, but obviously looking at your the space that your dog is in and looking at um, what you can do with that space um, to get keep them entertained and active and, and that sort of thing yeah um, but just does depend on the dog a lot but yes. yeah lots of enrichment toys and not just not just one I usually say to people to have at least three really good enrichment toys for their dog at least three um, and then there's other things that you can use um, you know that you can handmade hand make yes. you can use your cardboard boxes and things like that but have three really good toys that you can just rotate throughout the week and they don't have to be expensive they can just be um, just good solid toys that your dog likes and that they can't wreck yeah um, that they can get their food out of and, and as I've said before I'm sure ditch the food bowl yeah. let's get them <laughs> eating out of out of other toys and thing um, my dog's they eat out of slow feeder bowls, but yeah, they don't same. actually eat out of a normal bowl. Yeah. Um, and they can if they wanted to. I'm sure they could. But um, you know, it's they have to work a little bit for their for their food, um, yeah. and it's not mean. It's actually giving them that mental stimulation that we yeah. we want them to have. Um, and then after they've used their toys, they just go and have a nap because they're pretty yeah. they're pretty tired. So, um, and yeah, so really for the dogs that bored and bark, we're really looking at getting them uh, lots of thinking outside the box a little bit, getting them lots of different things to do. Yeah. Um, I recently did a video about um, slow feeding, which is a type of enrichment. Um, and so um, I go through all the different products that we have. Um, and there's there's also like there's one for every budget. Oh, yeah. But also um, one of the girls at our warehouse, she does um, scent work with her dogs in competitions. So she's been helping me um, and a few other others at work. Um, and we, um, you know, if we get a return back, we like to recycle stuff, but sometimes the boxes are just too knocked around. Yep. So <laughs> we take them home and um, we use it to do our nose work. Absolutely. So yep. when you get your order from us, you can um, use, use the, the boxes. Box. <laughs> use the boxes, absolutely. All the recyclables can go through your dog first before they then go in the bins. So. Yeah. Or the compost. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, um, you know, like that sort of thing. It's, you know, it's like you can get little cardboard boxes like, it's almost free yep. most of the time. So yep. it's, um yeah, really 
Yep. But so so it's so effective. One of my favourite things to do for um, dogs that just need an extra activity is to use a foraging box for them. So you put a small box and then another box, so box inside a box, inside a box, inside a box, so inside it's a like box. Past the parcel. Yep, and then every little box has something different in it. Cool. Um, and right in the middle one you might have like a long lasting chew or something that they can yep. sit and chew on for a few minutes. But they just have to I mean, yes, they make a mess, sure. But just pick up the mess it's fine it yeah. just you know the cardboard just goes into the recycling or whatever and the compost and it's fine yeah um, you just have to make sure obviously with um that dogs aren't ingesting that uh cardboard Definitely. um so again yeah. it depends on your dog and what you what's obviously we need to look at safety as well yeah. um first but yeah foraging boxes can be really good for dogs to just rip up and just get get their treats out of and yeah, get them cool. working yeah yeah when we're doing nose work we um like we have them on the lead. Sometimes we yes. do it in our lunch break. If you're wondering yeah. what happens in lunch breaks at Vet and Pet, it's probably Perfect. that. <laughs> Perfect. Love it. Getting dogs to use their noses. Yep, yeah. Definitely. Um, and then there is the um, social facilitation barking. So when everybody right. else in the neighbourhood's barking. Yeah. So that's when you can teach your dog that it's okay. So we go back to teaching our yeah. quiet cues. So we go back to, you know, calling them away. So having a really good recall away from the fence um, so perhaps that uh, we've done our visual blocking, we've done a little bit. So at really active times of the day, then our dogs are away from the fence anyway. Uh, but we can. That's when our training comes into play, where we recall away from the fence, and we. And I always say to people, when you're training your dog, you practice things when you don't need them. Yeah. So you don't you don't practice a you don't do a fire drill when there's a fire. Yeah. You always practice a fire drill so that when there is a fire, you know what to do. So you practice your training and you practice your recall and then when your dog is barking at the fence, it's more likely that they're going to come away because they know what to do. Onto a mat, sit, drop, calm, quiet and yeah, then, cool. then we treat. So we, we're not rewarding them for barking, we're rewarding them for all the behaviours that they're doing in between um, and then coming back and sitting on the mat is obviously – and being quiet is what yeah. we want. So um, – and often I'll say to my dogs, if another dog barks in the street and they, they look, they'll look, they be like, you know, that dog barked. Like, yep, I know, that's so-and-so. It's fine. Don't worry about it. You're right. And then yeah. they go, okay, cool. So, you know, you can teach your dog that it's okay, that they don't need to bark at everything. So. I found that Sage, he'll, he'll do a couple of big barks and then I'll, say, I'll just go like, shh, it's okay. And then he does what I call the whisper bark. He goes, <laughs> Having the last word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little whisper bark. So to make sure that you can still hear me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, so it's a similar thing with um, territorial. Um, yeah. yeah. And uh, with territorial barking, the environmental management is um, so Ooh. is so important. It yeah. really is because um, if uh, my dogs don't like the postman, like many other dogs, um, when and, and often it's hard to know when the postman's going to come, but you generally have an idea. Um, and if you're not home then don't give them access to the front fence. Yeah. Don't give them access to, to actually practice that behaviour. We know that behaviour that's practised becomes it, it's rehearsed, it becomes just something that they do all the time and we and it's self-reinforcing because the postman comes, dog barks, postman goes away and they think, yes, oh, I did it. That worked <laughs> really, really well. So we just want to, pre we want to prevent them from practising that. Yeah. So my dogs are inside in the morning when the postman is due to come yeah. so that they can't be out the front barking at him. Yeah. Um, so and and sometimes it, look, management can fail. We're only humans. It's not always going to be perfect, but generally speaking, we just want to like prevent the practice of that rehearsal, that behaviour. Yeah. So that's what we're really looking at doing with that environmental management, and then we're really changing. We're having effective behaviour change then. Yes. So preventing that rehearsal of the behaviour. Um, and I guess lastly um, is breed specific. I mean, this could be a huge yes. rabbit hole, but um, yes, there are some dog breeds that certainly have some interesting quirks yeah. um, when it comes to things. Um, I, I used to live um, somewhere and there was a guy who got a Maremma yep. to look over their calves and the Maremma um, bonded to the tractor <laughs> and wouldn't let anybody on the tractor. So they ended up having to get a professional in yep. um, so that the dog would leave the tractor alone. Doing what he's bred to do but just not the right <laughs> that's it. Just type displaced of thing. a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah displaced a little bit. <laughs> Look, breed-specific barking is, is really difficult because you can't uh, – there's a lot of genetics behind that. Mm -hmm. um, and – but training, training is your main – obviously, we, we look at environmental management as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so setting the dog up for success so that they're not – you know, um, if you do have a livestock guard, um, guarding breed, um, so a colleague of mine does have one, um, she's worked very hard on environmental management. It's very, it's very um, easy for the dog to just be somewhere else at certain times of the day. So yeah. in his crate, um, on the back deck, somewhere where he's just not looking at 
you know, all these other things that's causing him to bark. Um, so environmental management and training comes into play. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you have a dog that likes to do... Um, you know, like you're herding breed dogs and actually you want to do something with them, then there are outlets for them. So you can do specific sports and activities that get them barking and doing whatever they like. They can actually have an outlet for that. Yeah. Um, so we just have to be careful we don't switch on something that um, we didn't really want to switch on. <laughs> but but sometimes, um, you know, providing, um, you know, for example, uh, beagles that love to bark, you know, just something and other outlets for them to do, um, do things. So your agility, your... Um, you know, uh, lure coursing and things like that. So you yeah. can really give them different things to kind of have that outlet. Yeah. Um, and again, we can't we can't prevent and stop all barking, particularly for those breeds. So we want to look at if you have got a breed that is predisposed to barking, then we we need to be lo- really looking at that environmental management really hard. Yes. When I got a coolie cross Tasmanian Smithfield, I had an idea of the kind of barking I was in for, but it's still um, been a consistent um, challenge and um, has taught me a lot yeah. of patience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it definitely, it definitely does, yeah. The thing I think with, with, with him um, that, like, I find really difficult is that it, it just any, he just wants to chase anything and if he can't chase it, he gets really frustrated. Yeah. Um, and it's something I hear from clients as well with... with a herding breed seem to be the best at it, right? It's genetics. I mean, yep. you breed them for 50, 50 generations of chase stuff. It's yep. hard to stop that quickly. Yep. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I am working my horses, he thinks that he should be in there helping me, <laughs> especially yeah. if I'm doing groundwork. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he um, if, if he's in the house, he can, you know, he can see me out the windows and he'll bark at me. Um, if he can't see me then he's freaked out because he can't see me. <laughs> so it's like... Yeah, that's, that's, that's difficult. But, you yeah. could, you could, again, like you can teach him to be uh, away from you in short periods and then with something super high value to do instead. So a licky mat or a filled Kong toy with something yes. in it so that, you know, you're out walking, working your horse but he's like, okay, I can, I can see you but I've got something really yummy here so I don't have to bark at you. And we do it in small increments to train them that it's okay. That's what I've been doing lately yeah. is... Um, I actually, I have a very, like, my horse floats nice, by the way. Like, it's probably nicer than my house. <laughs> um, so I put him in the horse float with, you know, the, the nice cool air. It's nice in there. He'll have a licky mat and something else. So he's nearby and I can keep an eye on him and he can hear me, but he's got his stuff to eat. And that's been how I can get some peace and quiet. Yes. <laughs> Enrichment, him. environmental control. Yep. 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 And actually, one thing that I haven't mentioned before is... is um, a little bit of a background noise can often at night time, okay. like if you're playing some uh, soft kind of music uh, and there are dog specific music channels that you can, you can <gasps> download stuff off Spotify or whatever. Amazing. Um, and there's, you know, pet acoustics and um, through a dog's ear and all sorts of things you can get that just provide that just calming and, and you know, music can be quite effective for some dogs. Um, and if you're playing it at night, it's just, just, just drowning out some little like certain sounds that might happen at night, like possums and things like that. Yeah. You just kind of... You know, just muffling that a little bit so that can help them to relax a little bit too. Classic, really cool. Classics, not heavy metal. Yeah, you don't yeah. want to go for the <laughs> punk rock or something, but, yeah, something that's just nice and classical. There have been lots of studies about music mm. and dogs, but... Wow. Um, yeah, so just finding, um, just downloading, like, you just have to Google music for dogs and you get lots of stuff you can download. So yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. That's pro- That would be an awesome one to drown out the dogs down the road barking or... Maybe. You don't want too loud, but yeah. <laughs> that's it. If, if you hear really loud Mozart coming from my house, you know what it's about. <laughs> well, that is brilliant. Um, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I think, yeah, it really is. And, and everything is always individual to the dog yeah. and, and the situation. So we can devise plans specifically for your dog. So, yes. Yeah. So, um, yes, you can have a chat to your vet and then um, you can also have a chat to a professional trainer. Um, and you can have a chat to us at Vet and Pet as well, and we can um, help give you an idea of where to begin if you're not sure as well. We have heaps of products um, that can be really useful for um, dealing with all of this stuff. Um, so, yeah, um, I hope that this info has been helpful and given you some hope that um, there are so many things that you can do. Um, and, um, yeah, thank you guys so much for sharing all of your information and your knowledge with us. Thank you. It's truly, me. truly wonderful to have. Um, and thank you for helping me with some tips for Sage. <laughs> we'll have to let you know how we go. Definitely, definitely. Um, so thanks for watching. Awesome. Great conversation. Thanks.
Thanks. Thanks.